Famous Finds, the channel that shows your next buy. In this video, we're gonna talk about how Tiffany and Company was made. Before starting this video, like this video and subscribe to our channel for future updates. At this point in time, Tiffany and Company has become virtually synonymous with the sexiest and most refined interpretation of the high life. Simply taking in the image of the well-known Robin's Egg Blue Box with its silky white ribbon is enough to set anyone's imaginations racing with images of diamonds, evening guans, and dinner parties under chandeliers. When we see that box, we're all holy go lightly. We stop what we are doing, stare into it while sipping our coffee, and fantasize about living the high life. How exactly did Tiffany & Company become such an iconic brand over the years? It all began in 1837 when Charles Levitt's Tiffany, then 25 years old, and his schoolmate John B. Young, also 25 years old, opened a stationery and fancy goods store under the name Tiffany & Young with the assistance of a loan of $1,000 from Tiffany's father via Connecticut Biographical Dictionary, Tiffany & Company History. At the time, the shop could be found at the intersection of Broadway and Warren Street in what is now the Tribeca neighborhood of the downtown New York. The total amount of money made from sales on the first day was $4.98 via Tiffany and Company timeline. As the time went on, Tiffany and Young were able to keep their finger on the pulse of their fashionable New York audience while simultaneously discovering and perfecting the style that surrounded them. According to the website for Tiffany & Company, the company was motivated by the gauntlet of narrow streets teeming with horses and carriages presented a challenge for the fashionable ladies who were dressed in silks, satins, and barabond bonnets. They found a newly emerging American style at Tiffany & Company that was distinct from the European design aesthetic, which was based on ceremonial patterns and the mannered opulence of the Victorian era. This style was a departure from the European design aesthetic. In place of such dated appearance, Tiffany presented what new options were available, patterns that are characterized by their clarity, simplicity, and harmony. The year 1848 marked the beginning of the company's production of jewelry. This was done at a time when revolutions in Europe made it possible to purchase precious stones and diamonds from aristocrats in other countries at unusually low prices via Lang Antiques. Diamonds are made Tiffany & Company famous in the first place. Soon after, the shop relocated to Fifth Avenue and erected its very own structure there. Today, it's nearly impossible to think about Tiffany without also thinking about the Fifth Avenue and vice versa. Tiffany has become synonymous with Fifth Avenue. In 1861, President Abraham Lincoln presented Mary Todd with a necklace and pair of earrings made of Tiffany seed pearls. She wore them to the inaugural ball so that everyone could see them. Tiffany & Company won the grand prize for silver craftsmanship in the 1867 World's Fair in Paris, marking the first time that American designers had achieved such a prestigious honor from a foreign jury. This brought the company to the attention of audience all over the world, and it was during this time that Tiffany & Company became known. By the time that Charles Levitt's Tiffany passed away in 1902, the company had a capitalization of $2.4 million, and it had become the gold standard for jewelry in the United States or the diamond and silver standard, depending on the circumstances. The company became an industry pioneer in the Art Nouveau style when Tiffany's son, Louis Comfort Tiffany, took over the artistic direction of the company. No matter the decade or the shift in aesthetic preferences, Tiffany & Company remained at the forefront of luxury design via Business Insider. Some of the most prominent families in American society, including the Vanderbilts, the Astors, and the Whitney's, shopped at Tiffany. Franklin Delano Roosevelt even bought Eleanor's engagement ring there. The flagship store that we think of today, which was located at 727 Fifth Avenue, which Audrey Hepburn famously admired while wearing sunglasses, first opened its doors in 1940. This is the store where John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon purchased presents for their wives, where Richard Burton shot for Elizabeth Taylor, and where Mick Ryan's character Annie shot for Wedding China in the movie Sleepless in Seattle. How did Tiffany & Company come up with the idea for a color that is so instantly recognizable that it has become the go-to term for referring to the color in common parallels? 
The color is described as Tiffany blue on the Tiffany and Company website dedicated page for the hue. It's possible that the turquoise popularity as a gemstone in the 19th century jewelry played a role in the decision to go with this color. In addition, turquoise was a popular choice among Victorian brides who frequently presented their attendants with a brooch in the shape of a dove made of turquoise as a wedding day keepsack. Charles Levis Tiffany selected the blue hue for the cover of the first mail order catalog ever published in the United States, which bore the name The Blue Book and was published in 1845. It was referred to as Catalog of Useful and Fancy Articles on the page that served as its title. Quite quickly, it was adopted as the primary hue for all of the Tiffany's merchandise, including jewelry boxes, shopping bags, and promotional materials. In 1906, they had already achieved legendary status. According to a report in the New York Sun, Tiffany keeps one item in stock that he will not sell to you, no matter how much money you are willing to pay. Rather, he will only give it to you if you ask for it. That's one of his boxes, by the way. The rule of the establishment is unbreakable. A box that bears the name of the company may never be removed from the building unless it's accompanied by an item that's been purchased from them and for which they are responsible. The only exception to this rule is when the box contains an item that the company has manufactured. Today, Tiffany is having a hard time. Its acquisition deal with LVMH Moot Hennessy Louis Vuitton, which was worth $16.2 billion, is currently falling apart and LVMH is blaming Tiffany's poor management of business during the pandemic for the collapse of the deal via Wall Street Journal. According to LVMH, Tiffany's future prospects are extremely disheartening and significantly worse than those of the comparable brands of the LVMH group during this period. There have been lawsuits filed, one of which was filed by Tiffany & Company. There has been pointing of fingers, and even the French foreign minister has gotten involved via rulers. However, fans of the Tiffany don't need to be concerned, because analysts predict that the company will be able to withstand this storm. Tiffany will be fine, according to accomplished luxury retail consultant Robert Berg, who told Business of Fashion that Tiffany offers an image and a history that's kind of second to none and is highly attractive because of that. After all, is it possible to put a price tag on centuries of defining what luxury means in the United States? What do you think about this video? Do let us know down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear from us again, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go.